This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I am happy here to be here today with, uh, with Gretchen Rubin, who is known to the world as the creator and author of The Happiness Project and her new book, Happier at Home, but she's been a long time a uh, writer on different topics. She's a graduate of Yale and Yale Law School and was editor-in-chief of the Yale Law Journal. That's the official title, right? Yes. And yes. A, a Supreme Court clerk before you decided to pursue the path of, uh, of writing. And your specialty in the last few years has been, you really obviously touched a nerve is what it means to be happy. We're going to discuss various aspects of that, plenty of time for your questions. I wanted to ask you a few scaling questions to, to begin with. One concerns the ambitions of your project, of your message for the world. Here's what I mean. There are lots of people who objectively have tremendous reasons not to be happy. They are poor, they are disabled, they're in misery, they've had grievous losses, they are imprisoned, they're sick, etc. What is the reasonable range of happiness you're trying to, to bring to the world? Who are you really addressing with your, with your life's work of these past few years? Well, that raises a couple of interesting things. One is that when you look all around the room, most people say they're either pretty happy or very happy. So most people are pretty happy, and that's true in all different circumstances. People are very adaptable and can be happy in circumstances where we would imagine ourselves to be unhappy. Um, and within the range of happiness, I think there's happiness, unhappiness, and depression. And so depression, I consider its own very serious, urgent, condition and that needs every tool that you can throw at it, um, but is outside of the range of sort of happiness, unhappiness. I have a friend who said, I'm a, de I'm dep I'm a depressed person who's actually very happy. And I knew exactly what she meant by that. Um, but so within the, the ordinary happiness, unhappiness, when I started my project, I was, I was sort of concerned that people who were really in situations where they were very unhappy, like, they'd had some kind of catastrophe or some kind of you know, really terrible challenge, would almost find my approach flippant because it really is talking about these very ordinary types of things that you can do as part of your just regular day. And, um, and, and it was really aimed at for people who were in sort of ordinary circumstances. Um, and it's been interesting for me to hear from many people who are in what I would consider dire happiness circumstances, saying that they find that these little things are helpful, that sort of doing what you can as just part of your ordinary routine really can help you be as happy as you can be under your circumstances, even when your circumstances are unhappy. So I should ask here, how many people are familiar with the approach to life that Gretchen Rubin has, has been laying out in her books and her website? So we may go through some of, some of the, the basics. One of the things I find most fascinating about your approach is how practical it is. You have lists every Wednesday and you have, you know, tips to do, things to do, do each day. Is that an approach that comes naturally to you from the first time you emerge? Is it learning from Benjamin Franklin? How did you end up with this kind of approach to people, the small steps making a difference in people's lives? It, it is very much my approach. And I love reading about radical happiness projects like Thoreau moving to Walden Pond or Elizabeth Gilbert moving to Italy, India, and Indonesia. And, and, and there, I sort of, I, you know, it's very thrilling to read about that kind of thing. But I knew that for myself, you know, 
I'm not adventurous. I don't like to travel. I, I rarely leave my neighborhood. Uh, I eat the same food every day. Um, and, and so I needed to find things that I could just do as I very practical things, very manageable things. And, um, and so that was really where my, and I am a very Benjamin Franklin-y kind of, he's one of my patron saints. Um, so I like his, you know, let's make a chart and we'll write everything down and, and check it off every day. And uh, yeah, so that, that's definitely my bent. And for the people here who have not yet fully uh, lived your, your gospel, uh, give them some examples of the sorts of modest changes that you found uh, that people have told you have been most influential. So I am not saying that this is the most significant change that you can make in your life to be happier by any means. But the number one, resol whenever I talk to people who have done happiness projects, I say, well, what have you done? What worked for you? And I hear about dozens and dozens and dozens. But the one that people most often specifically mention as something that they've tr they now do that boosts their happiness is the resolution to make your bed. This little tiny thing, right? I'm not saying it's, it's, it's clearly a very small thing, but it's something, it's like the gateway drug of a happiness project. It seems to be the thing that gets people, um, and I'm the kind of person who makes my bed in the hotel room on the day that I check out. Um, but um, so it is, it's very small. So getting enough sleep and enjoying good smells. I'm now obsessed with the sense of smell. Uh, um, uh, a thing that's had a huge influence on the atmosphere of our home was now our whole family t made the resolution to give warm greetings and farewells so that when somebody comes and goes, instead of just grunting out a hello from across the room, people really c get up and say hello. And so something very small, doesn't take a lot of time, energy, or money, because nobody's got a lot of extra time, energy, or money, but just making, seeing these opportunities for small changes can sometimes really affect uh, the quality of your day. And if you, if you, uh, I hope that as soon as the session, as soon as the whole conference is over, you'll go to uh, to the Happiness Project website and see all the very the constantly refreshed stream of practical suggestions. As you walk around the world, as you see people looking sullen in an airport or in a train station or whatever, what do you observe? Are there any things you observe them doing? You think, oh, if only I could correct the person and have him or her do X, Y, or Z. What, what do you wish you were telling all of us as you observe us? Well, I don't have the problem so much with people like in an airport, but definitely with people that I meet and actually talk to, I have to hold myself back from being a happiness bully because I just want to <laughs> shake people and be like, you've got to go to bed on time. Um, uh, y yes, so sometimes I do see people doing things where, uh, um, uh, oh, a lot of times it, it also has to do with people making decisions which I feel like they're making for the wrong reasons, like they're doing something because they think they should do it, not because it's actually something that, that, that really rings true for them, um, and, uh, or, or going through motions that clearly aren't making them happy, constantly cutting everything too short so that their entire day is frantic, whereas I just keep thinking, like, if you could just start everything a half an hour earlier, you're just your whole life would be simpler. Or people who won't unplug from the phone, or you know, are staying up until two in the morning cruising the internet, and you just think, gosh, if you would just go to bed, you'd be so much happier. Um, but uh, yes, I, ha I have to hold myself back because I, I do, I do get try to. Uh, I, 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 know, I know that nagging and, uh, and uh, making <laughs> pointed comments is not gonna make anybody happy. I'll give you, a, in my own case, a success story, a failure story, and then a question. The success story is, back when I was in my mid-20s, which as you will guess was some time ago, I realized how much stress was coming to my life by worrying about making planes. So I just, yes. just decided always to get to the airport early. Then it just is a gigantic uh, you know, stress load cut yes. off. And, and yes. airports are horrible, but you can sit there and read yes. or do, do whatever else. That's my success story. My failure story is I am wired by my Neanderthal heritage to have <laughs> like a 26-hour clock. I yes. always stay up late, and I always feel as if I'm having to get up too early. Yes. You can tell me to change that. I can't. Right. So, so right. what would you, wh how will you fix me? Well, well, you're exactly right. It's, th there are larks and owls, and, and people really are, are in these categories, and it, it, it is very hardwired. So can you adjust your life to better reflect that, to just say, like, I'm not going to go, uh, my day starts at 10, or I don't know what, well, I, and, I, and, and just not even, pre not, and to try well, to. Why do you think I'm a writer? Very good. That's, there you it's, go. Yeah. So I don't have to get up. Yeah. And, and without getting too uh, detailed about this, my wife has exactly the opposite uh -huh. metabolism. Yeah, I am, I'm the same thing. I'm the lark married to the owl. The miracle is we have two children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it there. Yeah. Here's, 
Here, here's my question. The, I was living out of the country for a number of years. When I came back, the most depressing observational phenomenon was everybody looking at their hand no uh -huh. matter what else they were doing. Right. You know, raising their children, walking across the street, driving yeah. a car, always looking at their phones. Yeah. Can this habit be changed? Would this, if you were the happiness czar to break us of the plugged-in addiction, what would you do? Well, I think it's a it's a big big challenge for people, and that and and this this sense of constantly needing to connect, and also feeling hunted by that you know you've got a cubicle in your pocket, and you either should be working or could be working, or you constantly have to be checking in. And what I th what I find is wor works for a lot of people is to set boundaries. So maybe from six to nine, uh, so your is family time. So you just don't you just make the you, you put your your cell phone in an inconvenient drawer and so you don't do it or you use freedom or a similar kind of software program so you can't go online while you're working or uh, a lot of people have a technology sabbath where they take a day off um, and i have certain rules like that for myself where i i don't use it like i never my phone never rings it's always on mute um, i don't uh, i have no uh, announcements because if you hear that announcement you can't i mean you can't resist it's like i got an email what does it say you know <laughs> um and, and so, so I think a lot of it has to do with mindfully, not just falling into just a mindless responsiveness to it, because you are like the rat in the cage that every once in a while gets a good pellet, so you just keep hitting that bar. Um, and to really take, take charge of it and to say, well, how can, I, how can I use it for all the great things that it can provide, but, but so that it doesn't shove out of the way other things that are just as important or more important. Because I think technology is a good servant and a bad master, and so you just have to assert your domination, and you can control it, but you have to figure out what rules will work. As it happens, in the next issue of The Atlantic, I have an interview with David Allen, who oh, you right. know, the founder of, yes. of Getting Things yes, Done, yes, yes, who, yes. who was talking about exactly the same ph phenomenon of the random positive reward yes, from yes. emails. So Intermittent reinforcement is, is far more addictive than consistent reinforcement. So the fact that every once in a while you get a great email is gonna keep you going back more and more than if you every time went, you got a great email, so. Yeah. I'm going to ask about a number of similarities and differences. Um, as the audience will observe, you, you are a woman. Uh, and my I hope it's <laughs> obvious. <Yeah. laughs> and uh, my observation is there are trends in, you can find more men than women willing themselves to be chipper. And, uh, and that chipperness I associate more as a male than a female trait. But you are the expert. What are the differences between the genders? I on, have on never <laughs> examined chipperness. As, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, how about if we th therefore look at happiness instead? Are there any interesting um, differences between how men and women approach this challenge? Or yeah, should approach it? Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot of... Uh, research that's very focused on the difference between men and women. And I myself do not focus on that because, because to me, the differences among individuals are more powerful and interesting than the differences uh, uh, between men and women. And I, feel, and I feel like sometimes you can get sort of um, distracted by it, you know, and, and, and think like, well, because I'm a woman, I feel like da 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 da, -da and men are always doing blah, 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 blah. And, and then you lose the distinctions about how actual individuals are behaving, which usually doesn't break down so clearly. So I myself don't spend a lot of time focusing on that. But I will say that one of the things that's very striking about the difference between men and women is that a secret, and maybe the secret to happiness, is strong relationships with other people. And women tend to be more focused on that and, and, and see it as a higher priority to make, uh, to, 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 to keep that going. And so um, it's just something for both men and women to think about, um, which is how, w what are the things that you can do to make sure that the relationships in your life are strong and that you're increasing your, so you know, you're, you're expanding your social bonds and that you're really keeping them going strong. And as you travel around the world, is there any significant difference in your audience between uh, men and women? Well, it's interesting. I feel like, you know, it's hard to know because everything is so specific. I, um, I, I feel like I have more women who come to events, but then on my blog, it's very, it's very evenly split, it seems like. Um, so, so I, and I don't overly, I yeah. have, I'm not that good with my so statistics. I should be like <laughs> spending a lot more time thinking about my demographical information, but I don't. I'm so so uh, one of the, the fascinating um, tests that you lay out on your site is whether self-analysis, whether you're the kind of person who's making other people happy or unhappy, and what that tells you about whether you're the kind of people 
that someone, uh, that the kind of person other people avoid or that people are drawn to. Would you tell the audience some of the tips about whether in looking at your oneself, you can tell whether you're making other people happy or annoying them? Yeah. <laughs> You picked a very dark uh, blog <laughs> post to focus on. Yes, um, this is. I, 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 I was be, became very interested in the fact of like, well, would you know if you were the kind of person who was making other people unhappy? And so there's a, there's there's things that you can look for in the way people re relate to you. So for example, if you enter a conversation, does it tend to break up? <laughs> or if you. Um, or do other people act as your intermediaries? Like they say, oh, don't you don't have to have the, you don't have to tell them. I'll tell them for <laughs> you. So like you know your your son your son is like no, I'll tell my wife. D don't you talk to her? Um, and uh, and whether um, uh, you know when was the last time? Um, someone, we, you either gave or received a party or a celebration. Yes, no, it, it, but it, I, I encourage you to go to the site and find these checklists of whether you're the kind of person uh, who is making other people happy, happy or sad. I have another question on sort of the uh, extending from the, from the personal. Your, your newest book, Happier at Home, is about you know, ways in which uh, the dynamics of a family can work. And I'd be curious both to hear about that and about beyond the families, are there, we're in this age of tremendous friction, disagreement, hostility. We're in a political campaign four weeks from today where people seem not to be able to be happy about anything in the collectivity. How do you, tell us how you think about extending the lessons you have for individual happiness to larger units, first the family, and then if possible, beyond the family to actual societies. Well, it, with my Happier at Home project, I was focused on the relationships that came together in my home, which was, in my case, marriage and parenthood. But then, but obviously, that wouldn't be true for everyone. Everybody's home is different, and they have different kind of relationships that, that 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 are coming to converging in home. Um, and again, for the for the kinds of things I was looking at, it really was about having loving, attentive engagement, which, to your earlier point, means not constantly being on your phone or giving warm greetings or farewells, or having festive traditions, or having pictures of people around, um, or you know, setting aside time for the things that are really important to you. Um, so for instance, my older daughter, I didn't have much time alone with my older daughter now because her schedule is so much more complicated. My younger daughter, I still had, like I walked her to school in the morning, but I didn't have that time with my, my older daughter. So I set aside an afternoon a week because I was like, this is an important value to me that I'm not getting in my life, so how can I actually just figure out a way to have it? And so now I have an afternoon, a couple of hours every week, which doesn't sound like much, but it actually made a very big difference just in my relationship with my daughter. There's no nagging, there's no homework, there's no errands, we just do something fun together. Um, but, then there, but then you're right, your home is always in the context of your neighborhood, and whether that your neighborhood is sort of like the three blocks around your house, or whether it's your entire country or the world, um, there is this sense that you're, you, you have to exist in a larger network, and that's part of it. Um, and the sense of strife um, is interesting. I mean, I it's funny about news. I think there's a kind of, I, I've really, from what I've observed, there's a kind of person who is very drawn to bad news. Now, we're all drawn to bad news to some extent. So that's called the negativity bias. And it means that bad is stronger than good in our heads. So you remember a complaint or a criticism better than a compliment. And you remember bad news better than good news. That's just that's sort of human nature. But there are certain people that are, that are, that are mesmerized and sort of have an insatiable desire for true crime, natural disasters, um, you know, negative political, you know, and, and they just go deep, deep, deep into it, and they're very distressed by it. So for people like that, I think you have to draw a line between what is your obligation as a citizen of the world to be educated about what's happening, and what are you just indulging your inclination to learn all the gory details? And if those gory details are bringing you down, to just say to yourself, okay, I know what I need to know to be a citizen of the world, and I don't need to read about every little tragic story. And the same thing with political things. I mean, I think, if it's something where you're just getting very, very agitated and worked up to no good, it's not making you more likely to vote. It's not making you more likely to get involved. It's not making you take positive action. You kind of have to say, like, I should know, I need to know what I need to know, but I don't need to just work myself into a frenzy 
um, if it's upsetting me. Sometimes people, I mean, a lot of people like being worked up into a frenzy, especially about political stuff. They get a huge kick out of it. Like, you know, it's, a big, it's, 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 it's interesting and engaging for them. But then some people really get very distressed by it. You know, what is our country coming to? And, 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 uh, and, I, and I, I just think there is a limit where beyond which it's not constructive, unless it does motivate you to get involved. Right. Because sometimes people get so worked up, they're like, I'm going to join, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to get out there. And that's obviously good, because we want people to be very engaged in the political system. But sometimes it's, that's not what it is. It's, just, it's, it's a kind of, just, it's just redundant and, 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 and not constructive. Two related political comments that, that I, I have found interesting are connected to what you're saying. One is you mentioned how much more powerful uh, complaints are than compliments, et cetera. Think for the moment of the psyche of somebody who decides to run for public office, including president. Whichever person wins this election will know and have to be at peace with the fact that tens of millions of people hate him. You know, yeah. just think that he's uh, yeah. either, you know, uh, whatever yeah. negative adjective you yeah. have for either of these candidates. And, and being able to endure that really separates people who can be politicians from, from the rest of us. The, the other point I'd make is you talk about the, how it's, it's not healthy to be sort of consumed with upset and things going wrong. The distinctive achievement of Fox News, I think, entirely apart from its political perspective, is this air of constant um, outrage. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think and it's found a way to sort of cultivate that among a, a, a viewership uh, in a way that hasn't been fully replicated on the other side. But I think that's its particular invention, for mm -hmm. better and worse. Yeah, because worse people, some people really do feed off of that. Yes, yes. and it's the tone of just every story. And, and there's it's enough an things outrage. going wrong someplace in the world. There's a constant supply of those things. Yeah. You have written, you've written about how you deal with your children, how you deal with your family. Do you have senses of, as people go through life's arc, as they get older, as their children move away, as, as uh, they lose friends, how do you have a sort of particular set of prescriptions for how to maintain happiness later into life? Well, it's interesting. I mean, some people find it surprising, but actually older people tend to be happier. Um, and, and one of the theories about why this is, is that, is that when you're older, you, you know yourself, and so you've sort of accepted yourself, and so you're not battling these kind of you know, fundamental d uneasiness with, your, with who you really are. And that also that you have a sense that time is precious. And so you don't waste time on things that aren't important to you, and that your, your life starts to reflect your values better, because, because you, you, you really, you're spending your time on the activity and the people that are important to you, instead of um, you know, running around. So, so it's interesting li that life satisfaction goes up. And uh, I'll give you the chance to um, give, for those who don't know it, one of your most important mantras about the days are short. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, the days are long and the years are short, yeah. which is connected to what you're just saying about preciousness of time. Right, right. Well, I think of everything that I wrote, the, I, I, that I've written about happiness, this one phrase, the days are long, but the years are short, is one that re really resonates with people. So this idea that sometimes, you know, you get up in the morning and you think, by the time I get back in bed, like I can't even imagine all the things that have to happen, and like it just seems like this 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 unending journey, um, and then you know a year passes in a flash, and you think, wow, what happened in March? I have no recollection, and I think that's just particularly poignant with parents, where you feel like any one day can feel like like the length of a Saturday afternoon can sometimes be um, daunting, but then kindergarten is gone in a flash, and so to write, to really appreciate the moment and to appreciate the season of life that you're in as it's happening. One reason why I've s spent so much of my life moving from place to place, yes. I've lived, you know, yes. 15 or, uh, is that somehow it makes the time more memorable yes. and denser. To no, me. and this is really, I, I was, yes, absolutely. One of the things that's, that's, that's kind of surprising is we have this idea that um, time flies when you're having fun, but actually, when, when life is very, when one day is very similar to the other, they tend to just blur by, and, and you can't remember, and you can't remember it. And interestingly, I was reading uh, an interview with um, a, a monk saying how quickly time passed in a monastery because of this thing of every day being the same. And when you have a very unusual uh, circumstance, like especially something like living in a different country where there's so much new information coming to you that it's like you get double life. Mm -hmm. um, and then one year feels like a, a whole episode. A friend of mine said when he had a new baby, he said, I one of the things I loved about it is that we felt like our life was speeding by and all of a sudden it's slowing down again because just everything that is so new about having a baby um, 
gave that sense of concentrated life. But I think the, e the, the most re replicable way to do this is to move to a foreign country, because that's just yeah. very, th there's just so much coming at you that you have to process that it is a very intense uh, I'm glad to have official sanction yes. for what's been our policy yes. uh, uh, over no, the years. No, in fact, I, I never want to live, I don't, I don't even want to move from my neighborhood, and I've been thinking, <laughs> what can I do in my own life to sort of do that, because I also feel, I, I want more concentrated life, and so I need to find something to shake myself up so I have that experience. Although on the no free lunch principle, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. the, what is true is that, it, you know, it lived a, a, a lot of different places, and so you have a, a sort of longer, a sense of a longer, denser life, but a series of intermittent deaths because oh. you're leaving this part, you know, you're not gonna live in Malaysia anymore, you're not yes. gonna live in Japan anymore, et cetera, right. et cetera. So it's, but on net, it's, sort of. I found it worthwhile. <laughs> right. So, so in your own life, what's been, what are the main happiness challenges you still wrestle with? Oh, the biggest obstacle to my happiness is myself, for sure. Um, I have a very irritable, high-strung, uh, fly off the handle kind of temperament. And many, many, many of my resolutions are aimed at making sure that I stay calm and lighthearted and don't behave in a way that doesn't reflect the way I want to behave. Um, so that's one of them. Another one is I'm a tremendous workaholic. Like I would just, I would just work all the time. I love to work. And yet I know that there are other things that are important to me um, that I have to make time for. So I always am having to figure out ways to control that impulse. And so I have a lot of paradoxical uh, resolutions, like force myself to wander and schedule time to play and things like that. I, I have a resolution to kiss in the morning, kiss at night with my husband. So I actually have a kissing schedule um, because you know, if it's not on my calendar, it doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, and so, and so it, that's that. And then, and, uh, and it is, it is just making time for the things. And then, and then you know, my fr my fr I have 12 personal commandments, and my first personal commandment is to be Gretchen. And naturally, everybody should substitute their own name. Um, <laughs> but uh, Thank you. I get ribbed by, about that quite a bit. Um, but, but always, you know, the more I found that the more my life reflects my nature, my values, my interests, the happier it is. It's, it feels simpler, but also more rich. And, and yet it is so hard to be yourself. And you think, what could be more obvious than to be yourself? Because you just hang out with yourself all day long. Um, but this is one of those ancient precepts of happiness. Know thyself is on the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And yet there's so much, you know, it's what you think you ought to be or what you wish you were or what other people think you ought to be or what you assume is true of all of human nature. And, and you lose sight of what is actually true for you. And then the more you do, I mean, I had a friend and she said, uh, so, oh well, Gretchen, you know me, I hate the outdoors. <laughs> and I thought, excellent, you know, go for it. You hate the outdoors, stay inside. I mean, she knew that about herself. <laughs> it was bold. I, 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 have, I, have <laughs> I have two more questions, then I'll, I'll ask the audience, invite the audience. One is, I, I think the part of your overall life view that would be hardest for people like those watching online and, and in the crowd today is to set bounds on busyness and ambition and work because we all could do more. There's always another yes. email you could answer, yes. another blah, blah, blah. What have you found to be the effective message for people who are busy, who've been successful in life because they are busy, because they'll take on more work, how do they break the cycle of pain? Well, one thing that's very helpful to remember just, just as you're tapping into your ambitious side is think about it and think about the people that you know. Working the hardest is not the fastest way to get from A to B. And just being the one that's always answering your emails, that's not what makes people succeed. So don't kid yourself uh, about what the value is of what you're doing. Um, and the other thing is, I think, to, to, to really mindfully think through what you're doing and what's important to you. Because if you're like, my work is important to me and my family is important to me, and yet you make no time for your family, then your life doesn't reflect your values, and that ultimately is going to make you less happy. And so to really sit down and think about, like, well, what would I want my life to be? Not always just to be reacting, but to say, well, how can I, how can I crowd everything that I want into my day. I don't like the term balance because balance to me suggests that like everything's very calmly and, and with lots of room for everything and peacefully arranged and that's not my experience of life. So I always think I'm gonna crowd my life with the things I love 
And that means that things that I, that, I, that I don't love have to fall away. So sometimes you just have to decide to yourself, well, it's not a, it's not a value for me, so that's just not get, it's just not gonna get done because other things are more important. Um, so it always comes back to this idea of mindfulness and really deciding what do you want your life to look like and what do you want your life to consist of and your everyday life had better reflect that or it's not gonna happen. So if you think, I want time for friends, okay, and how is that gonna happen specifically? How is that gonna happen? Because just sort of telling yourself that you, that you hold something dear, um, you know, it should be reflected in your time, how you spend your time, how you spend your money, what's in your house, you know, what, where your relationships are. Um, now, a friend of mine said to me, ambitious people can't be happy. And I don't agree with that. But I think it's perhaps more challenging for people who are very ambitious. My other question is, in my observation, which no doubt is skewed, two of the great enemies of happiness are a sense of guilt mm -hmm. and a sense of like resentment or mm -hmm. being slighted. Yeah. Um, how do you ha have people cope with those two enemies of happiness? Well, one of the things people sometimes seem to think is that my, what I would say you should do, it, what you should aim for is to be blissfully happy at, at 10 on the 1 to 10 scale, 24-7, and that would be a good life. And I mean, that's not, that's certainly not possible, and I don't think it would even be a good life. But things like guilt and resentment or anger or boredom um, are really useful symbol, signs because they're big flashing signs that something in your life isn't right. So if you're feeling guilty, it's because some, you're doing something that doesn't reflect your values. It's not in keeping with the way, what you want to expect from yourself. Now, so what are you gonna do about it? Um, and if you're feeling resentful, why are you feeling resentful? Um, now, sometimes you can, you can do certain things like cultivating a sense of gratitude is a very easy way to drive out resentment. Because when you think of all the reasons that you have to be grateful to somebody, you tend to feel less resentful. Um, so there's ways you can do it that way, or you can change your behavior um, so that you don't feel guilty. So actually, I think these negative emotions are really, really important to a happy life because they show you where you have opportunities to bring your life more into your values, more into alignment with your values. I have lots more questions, but I'm going to give other people a chance. So if you raise your hand, a microphone will come to you. And then while each person is asking a question, the microphone will go to, to the next person. So who? So how about up here? We'll start with this gentleman in the second row. And then our microphone team will give microphones to others in the meantime. Great. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Greg Jabin from Del Mar. Um, I enjoyed the uh, discussion. Uh, I've got two related questions. And the first one, I'm not trying to be funny, but what's the relationship between shopping or buying something and happiness? And the second question is, what's the value of anticipation? You know, the recent studies that show that the expectation of going on that vacation actually is more enjoyable and brings more happiness than the actual vacation itself. Those are two very large questions. Um, there is a tendency, I think, uh, for people to totally dismiss the relationship between money, possessions and happiness, and to say less is more, simplicity is everything, stuff doesn't matter, I don't care, I'm not materialistic, I don't want to buy stuff and keep stuff. But I think the common experience of mankind is that possessions, for most people, do play a role in a happy life. And um, for better or for worse, Shopping is a way that we engage with things that we love, just the same way that reviewing things that we love or taking pictures of things that we admire or talking about them uh, or collecting them. It's a way of engaging with the world. Now, again, it's a good servant and a bad master, and clearly there are people who, who do it to an extreme that seems either socially reprehensible or, or, or um, uninteresting to hear about, or, you know, I mean, there's an extreme where it's negative, but I do feel like sometimes there is a lack of emphasis on the role that they can play. And there was this super interesting study that was done many, many years ago, like in the 70s, I think, by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, whose name took me a long time to learn how to pronounce, um, of flow fame. And they did a study in London where they went to people and said, what is special to you? in your house. And everybody in the household they would ask and they would talk about what was special to them. And what was interesting is there were a few people who said, things aren't important to me. 
People are important to me. And they said, well, that was very interesting, except when they looked at the people, they were the most isolated and lonely people. And that people tend, people who are highly engaged with other people tend to locate those feelings in possessions. And so when you re I really look at people's possessions, they're like, this is the dining room table that I bought because I love to have people over, and this is the rocking chair that was my grandmother's, and um, this is the vase that I bought on my, on, my, on my honeymoon. And so, you know, objects are more than just objects, and that they, rep they, they, they hold a lot of value for us. Um, and clearly, if all you're doing is running out and, and buying a new pair of boots every afternoon, that's not something that's going to make you happier. But I, th I, think for, I think wisely, when you think about it, about th that possessions are, do have a role to play. Um, and the other one was anticipation. Anticipation, there's four stages of happiness. There's, um, there's anticipating, there's um, savoring, there's expressing, um, and there's another one I can't remember right now. But, um, uh, and so anticipation is, and there's something called rosy prospection, which is when you do anticipate things more, um, then you actually have happiness in the moment. And so one thing that's really helpful with, if you're thinking about how to make your life happier, is to think about how to plan ahead for things, instead of impulsively going to a bookstore, think, oh, on Saturday I'll go to the bookstore, and then you have all the fun of looking forward to it. Um, and so anticipation really is, is really, is really, uh, really a, a sweet part of happiness. Where's the next microphone? Uh, yeah, yes, sorry. Um, my name is Sue Rutledge from La Jolla in Washington, D.C. I like very much your approach of happiness coming from living your own values. And I've got an economics background. It seems to me one could do an expected happiness impact evaluation of every, th every decision. And so uh -huh, you choose yes. what yes, to yes, do. Yes, yes. <laughs> happiness bang for the buck. Yeah. 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 Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And what I find is that the greatest happiness is not in receiving gifts from people, but in making those gifts. I wonder if you could talk about the relationship between giving and receiving as a happiness impact. Yes, I mean, I think your point is very well taken, and that one of the things about being mindful is actually thinking through, like, what is going to be the happiness impact of this, and what's going to be the happiness impact of that. So for instance, back to this idea of possessions, like, if you're thinking, should I buy a new chair, or should I take a trip to see my college roommate, the thing that is going to deepen a relationship is the thing that's probably going to bring you more happiness. And so that's a way to think about trade-offs uh, of time, energy, or money um, in a way to do that. Um, but uh, wait, and what was the second? No, no, just uh, giving. Oh, giving versus receiving. Yes. Well, it's, it's really important that, that, that it turns out that giving support is just as important to happiness or more important to happiness than getting support. And think about it. Like, what, what do you remember more fondly? Like, the, birth, the, the surprise party you threw for somebody else or the surprise party somebody threw for you? It's like that, that, that giving and feeling like you're contributing um, is so sweet. And... Um, when I started trying, because my lawyerly background, I was trying to understand, like, how do you broadly understand happiness? Like, what's the framework? And there's feeling good, feeling bad, feeling right, and the atmosphere of growth. And I didn't really understand the atmosphere of growth for a while. But an atmosphere of growth is very much part of happiness. And it's definitely like, if you feel like you're helping, or you're making something better, or you're teaching somebody something, or you're fixing something, or you're, you're just making something better, um, it's a huge engine of happiness. And so this idea that, you're, that you are giving out um, is enormously satisfying to people and, and a huge driver of happiness. N next up down here, yes. Hi, Gretchen. Paul Schwartz. I'm part of the American Dream Project. And I want to ask you about happiness at work. And I've read everything from happiness at work is not possible <laughs> to organizations that believe the more they invest in their employees' happiness, the better the organization is. A, is happiness at work possible? And B, what are some of the things that managers and leaders can do to improve the happiness of their workplace? Well, I think happiness at work is possible. Um, and, and yes, people who are happy at work are, you know, it's very, even if only for self-interested reasons, like people are more productive and they, they, they don't have burnout and absenteeism and all, all kinds of things. There's all kinds of reasons why it makes business sense for people to be happy at work. And certainly, we want people to be happy at work because people spend so much of their time at work, you know. Um, and there's a lot of things. When, when they look at people who say they're happy at work, there's, there, there's many elements that come up. For, for instance, people who say they have at least one close friend at work tend to say that they're happier at work. And people who say, my boss cares about me and wants to see me advance. This is not like the visionary boss at the top. This is the person that is immediately 
above you and feeling like that person cares about you, knows you, and, and wants to see you improve. Um, interestingly, like one of the things is like, is there a sense of fun? Like, are there birthday parties? Are there holiday celebrations? Are there goofy traditions? Um, are, is, do you, do, are, there, are, are people able to laugh at themselves and see the funny side of situations? And you know, I clerked for Justice O'Connor, and, and you know, the Supreme Court is a very serious, thoughtful, um, quiet place. And Justice O'Connor is a very formidable personality. And yet she did all these things to make our workplace kind of have this light element. For instance, she insisted that her, and I mean she insisted that her clerks do a Halloween pumpkin decorating display. And she had high standards. And so there we were, and I remember thinking at the time, is this really the highest and best use of our time as clerks to be doing a you know, suffragette themed pumpkin in honor of the, <laughs> uh, in honor of the ex, you know, anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, but but it actually was really fun. And when I look back on that time, that's one of the highlights of it. And it really did a lot to to give us a feeling of camaraderie and fun, and that and that we weren't always nose to the grindstone. And there really was this opportunity to connect and to do, and to do, and to have this 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 more um, this goofier side. So I think there definitely are a lot of things. Um, and 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 interestingly, it matters to a great degree that people feel like the company or the boss or whatever is trying. It almost doesn't matter if it works. It's like if you put in the ping pong table and nobody wants to play ping pong, they still appreciate it. They know you're trying, you know, well, the ping pong table, not so much, but thank you. You know, I mean, so, so sometimes just like going through the gestures of doing this is also important to show that you, that you care and that you value people's happiness um, and um, that you're trying to do what you can within the limits of the workplace to accommodate that. So next up here. Then. Hi, Nancy Sattel Weiss. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, and so I deal with a lot of hormones. And so part of my philosophy is that hormones make the world go round. <laughs> Have you looked at the physiology of happiness and perhaps consider partnering up with Larry Smarr about monitoring <laughs> Let's have a male monitoring your happiness level yes. so that when you're in a zone that um, you, oh my gosh, I'm, my happiness is getting depleted, I think I'll remove myself from the situation, or yeah. wow, I'm getting close to someone who's making me happy, or even going back memory lane where we can think ourselves happy, if you recall happy stories, but yeah. having some biofeedback for the physiology of happiness. I'm a big believer in monitoring, though I have to say Larry has taken it to depths that I have, would not have not yet explored. Um, you know, um, that's really interesting. I mean, I feel like there's a lot to be done. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit just with what's in your conscious mind. So I haven't, I haven't thought about, um, but I, I agree that, the, that a huge and often overlooked aspect is what is happening with our body. And, and even if you don't, can't get your, a sample of your blood taken, you can say, am I too hungry? Am I too cold? Did I not get enough sleep? Am I not getting enough exercise? Are my clothes too tight? Are my heels too high? Is the light at my desk too bright? Um, because these things really will add to your sense of irritability or, or, or feeling lethargic or feeling like everything's over, uh, is too much trouble. Um, but it's, I mean, it's, it's obviously a huge part of what's going on that we're not, that we're not consciously aware of, so it's, it's really interesting. So we have about five four more minutes, time for a couple more questions, if they are up there, okay, in the upper deck. Hi, uh, Brad Auerbach. I had a question. Um, I read a Kindle single, um, I can't recall the author's name, but uh, you're probably familiar with it, the, Happy, um, the Happiness Manifesto. And he talks about trying to turn, you touched on this before with regard to possessions, turning um, the analysis of the gross national product, gross domestic product, into something more important in the sense that the gross national product takes into account you know, the locks you pay to put on your door, but it doesn't take into account the sort of somewhat immeasurable things that do make you happy, the time with your daughter, et cetera. Um, do you have any commentary on that? You well, know, actually, there's a lot of interest now, sort of on the on the governmental level, um, on trying to quantify it. And I was talking to a guy who works at the UN about how they're trying to come up with some sort of uh, standard of measurement that would be like G GDP. Um, and think about that, though, across the world of coming uh, coming up with a set of standard. Factors. It's like it's, it's very intellectually challenging, um, but it's it's interesting that like there's there's a lot of interest now in trying to quantify um, and to take into account 
things that are that are that are that are right now are not being so taken into account. So one of the one of the things that's really true is that you tend to manage what you measure. And if you measure it, you're, you, it's much easier to know whether you're doing it or whether you're not doing it. And so one of the things I do for my happiness project is I try to measure everything that is important to me. Because if I say to myself, am I spending time with my daughter, then I know if I'm doing it or not, rather than just having it being this loose, this loose value. And certainly on a governmental level, the same thing. Like If we want people to have a sense of neighborliness, how do we quantify that? How do we judge that? And how would we amplify it? So it's a, very, it's a, it's a really interesting and challenging um, thing that's being, that's being worked on now. Next question. Where is the microphone? Over here? Sorry. Yes. Yes. Uh, I wonder about people uh, in post-retirement, uh, uh, how they can uh, maintain happiness best. Well, one of the things is, again, back to this, this is the same old thing, strong social ties. So people who have strong social ties and strong social lives and feel y or tend to be happier. And people, um, and back to this idea of giving, people who feel like they're connected to the community and, and, and somehow uh, uh, in that way is also. And, and after retirement, people who have, who have interests and hobbies tend to do, um, tend to, have, to, to feel happier. And so, um, so a lot of it is how socially engaged you are and how sort of intellectually engaged you are with uh, things that are interesting to you. And health, too. You we know. have time, time for one more question, if it's terse, and I'll, I'll leave our microphone. Yes, here we go. I, I, I hope this isn't, isn't too silly of a question, but I wanted to go back to the making of the bed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, first, I was wondering if that's more a male versus female, and then if you're married, doesn't matter who makes the bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one of the things that has really struck me about happiness, and it's kind of surprising, is the degree to which, for most people, outer order contributes to inner calm. And, so, and, I, and that is not a male-female thing. And, I, and, and sometimes people sort of assume. But I mean, I, in my judgment, it really is uh, its a personality thing. And it doesn't divide on gender lines. My own view about making the bed is the rule is last one out makes the bed. You know, it's like uh, you know, price you pay for for laying in. Um, so in my case, my husband always almost always makes the bed, but if he gets up first, I make it. Um, so um, and yeah, and and I, maybe there's a special value to being the one to make the bed, but um, I think just having the bed made is it's just it's like at the end of the day you walk in and it's just much more just much more of a serene. Um, environment, plus you can find things more easily. Like how many times you make the bed and you're like, oh, there, there's that thing that I was looking for, my iPhone charger or whatever. <laughs> um, and that makes you happy too. So um, yeah, it's, uh, I admit it sounds like a tiny, tiny thing, but it's, it works. I speak for all of us in saying we are much happier now for having heard this <laughs> talk in the last, please join me in thanking Gretchen Rubin.